Hello, my name is Mark Norris, and it feels kind of weird to say my last name without having to spell it afterwards. It's kind of something that happens to me. Anyway, I'm a self-published author, and today I'm going to do a reading of one of my stories for you. I have a collection of short stories available on Amazon for only $2.99 without VAT. Thanks to that little annoyance of VAT, the full price is actually a little bit more. Books are worth it though, especially mine. I'm not going to read the entire book to you, because as a famous madman once said, if you're good at something, never do it for free. And yes, I just quoted the joke there. <laughs> I am, however, going to read an entire short story from it. So buckle up, because this could take a little longer than I expected, because it's a little long. I also plan to do some more readings further down the line. I just decided to space them out, and do one a week. So, for your listening pleasure, I present to you the story Tulips, from my book Tulips and Other Stories, a story that has legitimately made people cry. I hope I can do it justice. I was awoken by the sound of laughter and someone bouncing on my bed. I tried to swap the sound away, but whoever it was was being persistent. I knew there was only one person it could be though, my little girl, Cheryl. I knew it had to be morning, but in my head it was still early, and she was ruining my sleep. I told her to bother me later, but that just spurred her on more and made things worse. Now she knew I was awake, she was determined to make sure I stayed that way. She sat on my stomach and kept poking me in the chest, so I reached up and tickled her and pulled her down into a hug to stop her from moving. Sitting up at last, I kissed the top of her head and sent her away while I got dressed. She herself was already dressed in a red dress that I knew had always been her mother's favourite. Looking at the calendar I could see what day it was. Shara was young, but she already knew what day it was and what we would be doing. Cheryl is eight now, and it's been three years to the day since her mother died. Every year on that day we go to her grave with new flowers. We visit occasionally still during the year, but we make a bigger deal out of the anniversary. I guess Cheryl has noticed what day of the year it is when we go with the flowers, and has noticed we did it two years in a row. She's quite a clever girl when I think about it. Her mother would have been proud. I'm sure of it. Stepping out of my bedroom to go to the bathroom, I hear Cheryl moving about downstairs. I wonder what she was up to before getting ready for the day. Twenty minutes, and some slight hassle with a suit later, and I'm standing in the kitchen, where I see that Cheryl has already made some cereal for me. She left a bit of a mess on the side, but it's nothing really. Easily cleaned up. I decided to eat the cereal first though. I couldn't see Cheryl, but I could hear the television in the front room, and I could guess what she was up to. After I had eaten my breakfast and we were both ready, and it was late enough, we finally left the house together. She held onto my hand as we walked down the street to the flower shop. I knew which flowers she would go for. The tulips, of course. Tulips had always been her mother's favourite flowers, and during the time they were together, she seemed to pass that down to Cheryl, who now treasures them herself. <laughs> tulips were what we left on were what we left the other times we went to her grave. After paying for the flowers we carried on further down the road and a few and a few more roads until we got to the cemetery. Cheryl was very respectful and well behaved. When we got to the grave, she laid the flowers down on it and said her pra a prayer for her mom and had a brief cry. I held her close while she, w while she cried and talked to her mom and when she was done, I said some things myself and we left, hand in hand. On the way back home, she asked me if we could go to the park. She really loved this park because it had a whole field full of tulips. She liked to play in there too, but that was the main attraction for her. I told her we could, and so we stopped for a, for a while. I watched her play while I sat on a bench, except for a time when I pushed her on the swing. She played in the tulip field, but she never picked any. She would tell me that she would leave them alone, so that they were still there when she came back another time. I tried to tell her they would grow back, but then she just said that might take time, and it's better to just leave them be. I couldn't argue with that logic, so I just let her be. After she was done, I took her home, and after some more playing, I gave her some dinner, gave her a bath, and put her to bed. When she was, when she was put into bed, I watched some television and did some reading before heading to bed myself. 
The next day she woke me up again, but this time I didn't fight her as much. It was a Monday, and she had to go to school. She had already dressed herself and made me breakfast again. I thanked her, and we ate together this time. When we were done, and she was ready, we got in the car, and I took her to school. After giving her a kiss on the forehead, and wishing her a good day, I went back home and set up my computer. I worked from home as a writer, and I was nearly done with writing the story that I wanted and I wanted to see if I could get it finished before I had to pick Cheryl back up. That gave me about five hours, not counting any food breaks. I put some music on to keep me going, and I started writing. I was writing a fantasy novel. I like to write fantasy, and even though I always had a pretty vivid and wild imagination, I found my stories becoming more fantastic when Cheryl started talking, and her own imagination kicked in. I would sometimes ask her for ideas, and we would talk and work out some details together. I don't know if she really got what she was saying or doing, but she was happy when we were talking, and it brought us closer together. She even named a character or two for me, and I would set aside a bit of the money I made, planning to give it to her when she was older. I saw it as her share for what she put into the writing. I got stuck while writing though, and had to take a break. I hit a barrier I needed to work my way through, and I couldn't work it out. I watched some television to take my mind away from the problem to let it work itself out, and I left it at that. I noticed when I had something to work through with writing, it would occasionally just solve itself over time. I guess it's one of the benefits of having an active imagination. I have, to, I have just kept myself occupied in a sudden realization about how I can resolve an issue with a story. It didn't happen this time though, and I soon had to pick Cheryl up from school. We stopped off in the park. I still couldn't say no to her. <coughs> With it being so close to the anniversary. Although I usually did give in to her anyway. She knew just how to melt my heart. I could never say no to that face. She went right to her favourite place, the tulip field, and played in it. Just like I expected her to. After about half an hour, I called her back and took her home. I would have let her play for longer, but it was getting late, and it was getting to be dinner time, and I wanted to make sure that she was fed. Because we had stopped by the park, we couldn't have anything fancy because I didn't have time to cook anything, so I just made her some sandwiches and she had some other things with them. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. <coughs> if she got hungry again, then she would have some fruit or something to keep her going. Or, if she asked nicely, maybe even a chocolate bar. I didn't give in to her on everything, though. I wanted her to grow up fit and healthy. I didn't think I had much to worry about when it came to that. She was a very active child and loved to play in the park. I didn't expect her to have any problems staying healthy. I was working on my story again when she came up to me. She couldn't find anything to watch on television, so she decided to just come and see what I was up to. At least, that's what she told me. She hopped up on my lap and started reading my story aloud to me. I was proud of how well she could read, and hoped that she would grow up smart as well as fit. I would read her stories at night. If she hadn't quite tired herself out by the time she went to bed, then sometimes I would encourage her to read to me before I took the book off of her and kept reading for her. Like myself, she was fond of fantasy. She liked tales of beautiful princesses and heroic knights who would save them from, any from anything from fierce dragons to beggars and thieves. She even told me she wanted to learn how to ride a horse because sometimes a princess has to be able to take care of herself. I would tell her that I would always take care of her and protect her if she ever needed it, but that was never enough for her. She told me she still wanted to be able to look after herself. <coughs> I was going to arrange for riding lessons when she was a little older. Reassuring her of that would calm her down, and she told me that she'd sometimes had dreams where for once she was saving a prince. When she had finished reading, she asked me I wasn't, why I wasn't writing anymore, because she wanted to know what happened next. I told her that I was a bit stuck, but she said that, but she said she wouldn't help me. She wanted to know what happened next, and it would be a little boring if she told me what happened next. I, I asked her what she wanted to happen next, but... Uh, <laughs> My apologies. I asked her what she wanted to happen next, but she wouldn't tell me. She wouldn't get off my lap until I'd written some more either. I started writing and decided to just see what came to me. She sat there and watched me for a few hours. I heard an occasional laugh from her, so I knew she was still reading what I was writing. 
After I finished writing a few more chapters, I took notice of the time and saw that it was past Cheryl's bedtime. I hadn't even given her any supper. I hadn't eaten myself. I had managed to do a lot of writing though, so I thanked her for being an inspiration for me, and I put her to bed. She asked me how I came up with the knights and princesses, and I told her that I knew what it was like to be someone who would do anything for someone, because I would have done anything for her mother, and I would do anything for her. As for the princesses, I told her that they came to me because I knew someone who I could easily see as a princess. She was my princess, and I even made strong and brave to be. I kissed her goodnight and turned off the light while, talking, while taking one last look at my little princess. I had decided I had done enough writing for one day, and my muse was asleep anyway, so I took it easy for a few hours before heading to bed myself. <clears throat> the next day started pretty much how the others did, but with one key difference. Cheryl had woken up feeling ill. She was running quite a high fever, so I called her school and told them that she was too sick to go in. I made her some toast to see if she could eat anything. She was able to keep it down, which was good. I made an ice pack and put it on her forehead and watched her until she fell back to sleep. She woke up a few hours later, in time for her dinner. I made some soup for her and carried it up to her room on her tray. She was very well behaved and allowed me to spoon feed it to her. She just sat still and barely got anything on her, but if some spilled I would just wipe it away for her. After she had finished eating, she asked me to do some reading for her. I read to her for a while until I noticed she had fallen back to sleep, and I changed the ice pack for her while she slept. A few hours later I was sat downstairs doing some writing when she ran into the room. She had changed into her dress and she seemed to be doing just fine. She asked me for what she'd always ask me for in the afternoon, a trip to the park. I thought that it was too soon, and she should still be in bed, but she seemed to be doing just fine, and I thought that some fresh air might do her some good. I gave in, and we left her the park. When we got there, she went right where she always goes, the field of tulips. I went to where I, to where I always went, the bench next to it. <laughs> After about twenty minutes or so, a woman came and sat next to me. She told me her name was Amanda, and we started talking about our kids. She had a son herself, and she brought him to the park to play. She asked me which kid was mine, and I pointed to Cheryl, who was looking at all the pretty flowers. She pointed out her son to me, who was going down the slide at the time. I found myself having some fun with Amanda, and I was talking to her about how Cheryl was sick earlier, when I heard a dog barking. I looked where the sound had come from, and there was a dog on the other side of the road, outside the park. <clears throat> I looked back at where Cheryl was, and I saw she wasn't there. I started to panic and looked around for her, shouting her name. I saw her running towards the exit of the park, to the road where the dog was. I ran after her, but she couldn't hear me shouting her name. I saw her run out into the road, and I ran as hard as I could to get to her. I could hear a car, and I didn't want to think about what could happen. She was in the road now, and she heard the car. It was too late, though. It was too late for me too. I had just reached the road when the car hit. I can still see it happening. I don't think I'll ever get the image of her going onto the bonnet and hitting the windscreen out of my head. It was so sudden she didn't even have time to scream in pain. I, I don't know if I would have heard it anyway. My whole world went silent. Everything went into slow motion. I didn't even hear the car stop and the driver come out. The driver was apologizing, but I couldn't hear him. I couldn't hear anything. I didn't want to be there. An ambulance came, but it was too late. I was holding her and crying, and I refused to let go of her. They pried her away to tell me what I already knew. She was gone. My beautiful little girl was no more. I had lost her mother, and now I had lost her. I was an absolute wreck. My mind was completely shattered. I held myself together long enough for her to be buried. I put a wreath of tulips on the coffin. They were from the field. They would no longer go back to that field, and neither would Cheryl. I didn't think she would mind this one time that I picked the flowers. After that though, when I was allowed to stop being strong, that's when everything started to go wrong. I just... Stopped. I stayed in the house all the time. 
I closed the door to her bedroom and I left it closed. I couldn't bear to see it. I stopped writing too. I just totally stopped. I barely ate. I barely left my room at all. I didn't have many friends and so I had no one to really check on me and make sure I was doing things. I guess I must have still wanted to live if I occasionally forced myself to eat, but I wasn't really living. I was just there, just existing. I considered that it might be better for me to be dead. Both Cheryl and her mum were already waiting for me in the afterlife. I didn't really see what was stopping me. <laughs> I guess just the thought of them being disappointed with me when they saw me. I loved them too much to hurt them, even when they couldn't be hurt anymore. I was hurting though, all the time. I actually even deleted the story that I was writing. I didn't want to write again. I wrote so that Cheryl could read all these stories and be inspired and have fun. If she couldn't read my stories, then I didn't see the point in writing them at all. I only had some moderate success of a writer, and so it's not like I was famous enough for people to be asking where I was. I even remember thinking for too long and too hard on how she was ill that day, how I allowed her to go out when I knew she should still be resting. I started blaming myself and even hoping that she hadn't gotten better, if she had just stayed ill or if I had just said no to her and told her to rest even though she felt better, she'd still be here. I lived like that, in complete seclusion and solitude for a while. A never-ending cycle of loneliness and self-hatred. After some time, I think maybe six months, I woke up feeling a little odd. I actually wanted to get up for a start. I went to the bathroom and had a shower and shaved. I hadn't really been taking care of myself so I'd grown a beard. I kind of liked how it looked though so I just trimmed it down a little and left it. I remember smiling at that. It was the first time I'd smiled genuinely since the accident. I started to think that maybe I was getting over it and would be able to live again. I decided to try going outside, just for a short walk. I wasn't in very good shape anymore. <laughs> I turned at the gate and started walking before catching myself and walking in the opposite direction instead. That way led to the park and those dreaded tulips. I was moving on, but I still wasn't ready for that just yet. I walked around town for about an hour, occasionally shielding my eyes because the light was just too bright. I stopped in a shop on the way home to get some breakfast and made my way home. I contemplated writing but, like the park, I felt that was something I wasn't quite prepared for. I still had the mindset that, that if Cheryl couldn't read it, then I didn't want to write it. This continued on for a few months. Occasionally I wouldn't feel up to going out. but. That started happening less and less as time went on. I was soon going out every day, but I still never went to the park or wrote anything. I was using the computer to surf the net and talk to people, but that was all I really used it for. One day I decided to walk towards the park, but not go to the park itself. I would turn around and go another way before I reached the park. Just the idea of being near the park made me think of Cheryl though. I became lost in my thoughts and wasn't aware of where I was going. I was just moving forward. I didn't notice where I was going until something struck me and something in my head just snapped. I could smell tulips, Cheryl's tulips. I had walked the park without realizing. I couldn't escape from the past or this place. I hadn't been near tulips at all since the accident. To smell them now sent my brain over the edge and everything that I'd been bottling up just came out. I hadn't moved on. I had just been avoiding it. I broke down, fell to my knees, and cried. I knelt there and cried, hugging myself until I suddenly stopped. My mind had snapped again, and I knew what I had to do. I got up, and I ran home. When I got there, I turned on my computer, and I loaded up the word processor. There was a story I had to write. Even if Cheryl would never read it, I would write it. I would write her story. I would write everything that had happened to her. If she couldn't read it now, then I would just tell it to her in the next life. I knew then that I had to keep writing. I had to write as many stories as I could. If she can't read them, then I'll have to tell them to her when I see her next time. 
I might not have been able to write any dialogue because I couldn't bear to remember her voice, but I knew I had to write it. Even fantasy writers need to live in reality sometimes. As emotional as that story is, it was far more emotional to write it. If you liked what you heard, then follow the description to follow the link in the description down there to buy the entire book. There are eight stories overall, and not all of them are sad. There's a nice mixture of all the feels a person can feel, and something for everyone. If you liked what you heard as far as my voice went, then I'm always looking for voice work too. If you want my voice associated with something of yours, then hit me up with a message and we can work something out. In the meantime, thank you for listening, and I will see you next time. Farewell.